von Kempelen and his discovery by Edgar Allan Poe After the very minute and elaborate paper by Arago, to say nothing of the summary in Silman's journal, with the detailed statement just published by Lieutenant Morey, it will not be supposed, of course, that in offering a few hurried remarks in reference to von Kempelen's discovery, I have any design to look at the subject in a scientific point of view. My object is simply, in the first place, to say a few words of von Kempelen himself, with whom some years ago I had the honour of a slight personal acquaintance, since everything which concerns him must necessarily at this moment be of interest, and in the second place to look in a general way and speculatively at the results of the discovery. It may be as well, however, to premise the cursory observations which I have to offer by denying very decidedly what seems to be a general impression, gleaned as usual in the case of this kind from the newspapers, namely that this discovery, astounding as it unquestionably is, is unanticipated. By reference to the diary of Sir Humphrey Davy, Cottle and Munro, London, page 150, it will be seen at pages 53 and 82 that the illustrious chemist had not only conceived the idea now in question, but had actually made no inconsiderable progress, experimentally, in the very identical analysis now so triumphantly brought to an issue by von Kempelen, who, although he makes not the slightest allusion to it, is, without doubt, I say it unhesitatingly, and can prove it, if required, indebted to the diary for at least the first hint of his own undertaking. Although a little technical, I cannot refrain from appending two passages from the diary with one of Sir Humphrey's equations. The paragraph from the Courier and Inquirer, which is now going the rounds of the press, and which purports to claim the invention from a Mr. Kisam of Brunswick, Maine, appears to me, I confess, a little apocryphal, for several reasons. Although there is nothing either impossible or very improbable in the statements made, I need not go into details. My opinion of the paragraph is founded principally upon its manner. It does not look true. Persons who are narrating facts are seldom so particular as Mr. Kisan seems to be about day and date and precise location. Besides, if Mr. Kisan actually did come upon the discovery he says he did at the period designated, nearly eight years ago, how happens it that he took no steps on the instant to reap the immense benefits which the merest bumpkin must have known would have resulted to him individually, if not to the world at large, from the discovery? It seems to me quite incredible that any man of common understanding could have discovered what Mr. Kisam says he did, and yet have subsequently acted so like a baby, so like an owl as Mr. Kisam admits that he did. By the way, who is Mr. Kisam? And is not the whole paragraph in the Courier and Inquirer a fabrication got up to make a talk? It must be confessed that it has an amazingly moon-hoaxy air. Very little dependence is to be placed upon it, in my humble opinion. And if I were not well aware from experience how very easily men of science are mystified on points out of their usual range of inquiry, I should be profoundly astonished at finding so eminent a chemist as Professor Draper discussing Mr. Kisam, or is it Mr. Quizem's pretensions to this discovery, in so serious a tone. Uh, but to return to the diary of Sir Humphrey Davy. This pamphlet was not designed for the public eye, even upon the decease of the writer, as any person at all conversant with authorship may satisfy himself at once by the slightest inspection of the style. At page 13, for example, near the middle, we read, in reference to his researches about the peroxide of azote, in less than half a minute, the respiration being continued, diminished gradually, 
and were succeeded by analogous to gentle pressure on all the muscles. That the respiration was not diminished is not only clear by the subsequent context, but by the use of the plural were. The sentence, no doubt, was thus intended. In less than half a minute, the respiration being continued, these feelings diminished gradually and were succeeded by a sensation analogous to gentle pressure on all the muscles. A hundred similar instances go to show that the manuscript, so inconsiderately published, was merely a rough notebook, meant only for the writer's own eye. But an inspection of the pamphlet will convince almost any thinking person of the truth of my suggestion. The fact is, Sir Humphrey Davy was about the last man in the world to commit himself on scientific topics. Not only had he more than an ordinary dislike to quackery, but he was morbidly afraid of appearing empirical, so that, however fully he might have been convinced that he was on the right track in the matter now in question, he would never have spoken out until he had everything ready for the most practical demonstration. I verily believe that his last moments would have been rendered wretched could he have suspected that his wishes in regard to burning this diary, full of crude speculations, would have been unattended to, as it seems they were. I say his wishes, for that he meant to include this notebook among the miscellaneous papers directed to be burned, I think there can be no manner of doubt. Whether it escaped the flames by good fortune or by bad, yet remains to be seen. That the passages quoted above, with the other similar ones referred to, gave von Kempelen the hint, I do not in the slightest degree question. But, I repeat, it yet remains to be seen whether this momentous discovery itself, momentous under any circumstances, will be of service or disservice to mankind at large that von Kempelen and his immediate friends will reap a rich harvest, it would be folly to doubt for a moment. They will scarcely be so weak as not to realize, in time, by large purchases of house and land, with other property of intrinsic value. In the brief account of von Kempelen, which appeared in the Home Journal, and has since been extensively copied, Several misapprehensions of the German original seem to have been made by the translator, who professes to have taken the passage from a late number of the Pressburg Schnellpost. Fehler has evidently been misconceived, as it often is, and what the translator renders by sorrows is probably Lieden, which in the true version, sufferings, would give a totally different complexion to the whole account. But, of course, much of this is merely guess on my part. Von Kempelen, however, is by no means a misanthrope in appearance, at least, whatever he may be in fact. My acquaintance with him was casual altogether, and I am scarcely warranted in saying that I know him at all. But to have seen and conversed with a man of so prodigious a notoriety as he has attained, or will attain in a few days, is not a small matter as times go. The literary world speaks of him confidently as a native of Pressburg, misled perhaps by the account in the home journal. But I am pleased at being able to state positively, since I have it from his own lips, that he was born in Utica, in the state of New York, although both his parents, I believe, are of Pressburg descent. The family is connected in some way with Meltzel of automaton chess player memory. In person, he is short and stout, with large, fat blue eyes, sandy hair and whiskers, a wide but pleasing mouth, fine teeth, and I think a Roman nose. There is some defect in one of his feet. His address is frank, and his whole manner noticeable for bonhomie. Altogether, he looks, speaks, and acts as little like a misanthrope as any man I ever saw. File tool. We were fellow sojourners for a week about six years ago at Earl's Hotel in Providence, Rhode Island, and I presume that I conversed with him at various times 
for some three or four hours altogether. His principal topics were those of the day, and nothing that fell from him led me to suspect his scientific attainments. He left the hotel before me, intending to go to New York, and thence to Bremen. It was in the latter city that his great discovery was first made public, or rather it was there that he was first suspected of having made it. This is about all that I personally know of the now immortal von Kempelen. But I've thought that even these few details would have interest for the public. There can be little question that most of the marvellous rumours afloat about this affair are pure inventions, entitled to about as much credit as the story of Aladdin's lamp. And yet, in a case of this kind, as in the case of the discoveries in California, it is clear that the truth may be stranger than fiction. The following anecdote, at least, is so well authenticated that we may receive it implicitly. Von Kempelen had never been even tolerably well off during his residence at Bremen, and often, it was well known, he had been put to extreme shifts in order to raise trifling sums. When the great excitement occurred about the forgery on the house of Gutschmidt and Co., suspicion was directed towards von Kempelen on account of his having purchased a considerable property in Gasperich Lane, and his refusing, when questioned, to explain how he became possessed of the purchase money. He was at length arrested, but nothing decisive appearing against him was in the end set at liberty. The police, however, kept a strict watch upon his movements, and thus discovered that he left home frequently, taking always the same road and invariably giving his watchers the slip in the neighbourhood of that labyrinth of narrow and crooked passages known by the flash name of Dondergat. Finally, by dint of great perseverance, they traced him to a garret in an old house of seven stories, in an alley called Fletplatz, and coming upon him suddenly, found him, as they imagined, in the midst of his counterfeiting operations. His agitation is represented as so excessive that the officers had not the slightest doubt of his guilt. After handcuffing him, they searched his room, or rather rooms, for it appeared he occupied all the mansard. Opening into the garret where they caught him was a closet, ten feet by eight, fitted up with some chemical apparatus, of which the object has not yet been ascertained. In one corner of the closet was a very small furnace, with a glowing fire in it, and on the fire a kind of duplicate crucible, two crucibles connected by a tube. One of these crucibles was nearly full of lead, in a state of fusion, but not reaching up to the aperture of the tube, which was close to the brim. The other crucible had some liquid in it which, as the officers ventured, seemed to be furiously dissipating in vapour. They relate that on finding himself taken, von Kempelen seized the crucible with both hands, which were encased in gloves that afterwards turned out to be asbestic, and threw the contents on the tile floor. It was now that they handcuffed him, and before proceeding to ransack the premises, they searched his person, but nothing unusual was found about him excepting a paper parcel in his coat pocket, containing what was afterwards ascertained to be a mixture of antimony and some unknown substance, in nearly, but not quite, equal proportions. All attempts at analysing the unknown substance have so far failed, but that it will be ultimately analysed is not to be doubted. Passing out of the closet with their prisoner, the officers went through a sort of antechamber, in which nothing material was found, to the chemist's sleeping room. They here rummaged some drawers and boxes, but discovered only a few papers of no importance, and some good coins, silver and gold. At length, looking under the bed, they saw a large common hair trunk, without hinges, a hasp, or lock, and with the top lying carelessly across the bottom portion. Upon attempting to draw this trunk out from under the bed, 
they found that with their united strength, and there were three of them, all powerful men, they could not stir it one inch. Much astonished at this, one of them crawled under the bed, and looking into the trunk, said, well, No wonder we couldn't move it. Why, oh, it's full to the brim of old bits of brass. Putting his feet now against the wall so as to get a good purchase, and pushing with all his force, while his companions pulled with all theirs, the trunk, with much difficulty, was slid out from under the bed, and its contents examined. The supposed brass with which it was filled was all in small, smooth pieces, varying from the size of a pea to that of a dollar. But the pieces were irregular in shape, although all more or less flat, looking upon the whole very much as lead looks when thrown upon the ground in a molten state, and there suffered to grow cool. Now not one of these officers for a moment suspected this metal to be anything but brass. The idea of its being gold never entered their brains, of course. How could such a wild fancy have entered it? And their astonishment may well be conceived, when next day it became known all over Bremen that the lot of brass which they had carted so contemptuously to the police office without putting themselves to the trouble of pocketing the smallest scrap, was not only gold, real gold, but gold far finer than any employed in coinage, gold in fact absolutely pure, virgin, without the slightest appreciable alloy. I need not go over the details of von Kempelen's confession, as far as it went, and release, for these are familiar to the public. That he has actually realized, in spirit and in effect, if not to the letter, the old chimera of the philosopher's stone, no sane person is at liberty to doubt. The opinions of Arago are, of course, entitled to the greatest consideration, but he is by no means infallible, and what he says of Bismuth in his report to the Academy must be taken con grano salis. The simple truth is that up to this period all analysis has failed, and until von Kempelen chooses to let us have the key to his own published enigma, it is more than probable that the matter will remain for years in status quo. All that as yet can fairly be said to be known is that pure gold can be made at will, and very readily, from lead, in composition with certain other substances, in kind and in proportions unknown. Speculation is, of course, busy as to the immediate and ultimate results of this discovery, a discovery which few thinking persons will hesitate in referring to an increased interest in the matter of gold generally by the late development in California, and this reflection brings us inevitably to another the exceeding inopportuneness of von Kempelen's analysis. If many were prevented from adventuring to California by the mere apprehension that gold would so materially diminish in value on account of its plentifulness in the mines there, as to render the speculation of going so far in search of it a doubtful case, what impression will be wrought now upon the minds of those about to emigrate? and especially upon the minds of those actually in the mineral region, by the announcement of this astounding discovery of von Kempelen, a discovery which declares, in so many words, that beyond its intrinsic worth for manufacturing purposes, whatever that worth may be, gold now is, or at least soon will be, for it cannot be supposed that von Kempelen can long retain his secret, of no greater value than lead and a far inferior value to silver. It is indeed exceedingly difficult to speculate prospectively upon the consequences of the discovery, but one thing may be positively maintained, that the announcement of the discovery six months ago would have had material influence in regard to the settlement of California. In Europe, as yet, the most noticeable results have been a rise of two hundred per cent in the price of lead, and nearly twenty-five per cent in that 
of silver. The end.